Greetings and welcome back to Haftarot, the weekly video cast in which we take a look at the upcoming week's Haftarah, understand its basic message, and how it's related to the Kriyat Torah that it follows. Uh, my name is Yitzchak Et Shalom, and I'm delighted to be studying the Haftarah of Parshat Chukat with you. Parshat Chukat is something we need to take a look at in order to understand the connection. Parshat Chukat describes a number of the wars that Am Yisrael engages in uh, during the last year in the desert on their way in the triumphal march to Eretz Israel, And that includes the negotiations with Ammon and Moab, both of whom we are warned not to go to war against. And then uh, the successful war against Sihon and Og, the two Emori kings who had migrated from the west bank of the Jordan to the east bank, had conquered some of Ammon and Moab's territory and uh, and conquered in the Bashan for the north. And we were not warned to go against them. As a matter of fact, God said to go to war against them. And we, want, we went to war and we were successful. And indeed, part of Am Yisrael settled on the East Bank in the land that was taken from Zichon and Og. That's the famous two tribes of God and Ruvain and one of the families of Menashe. Uh, that's the necessary background to understand what goes on here. The Haftarah that we're going to look at is the story of one of the Shoftim. So a couple words about the Shoftim in order to understand, to understand the context. The book Shoftim, which is commonly translated as judges, is really a mistranslation. True that the word Shofet and the word Mishpat and Beit Mishpat and Mishpatim all seem to have, relate to juridical proceedings and adjudication. But the word Shofet doesn't mean that in its original sense. The word Shofet is related to the word shevet. Uh, as a matter of fact, as uh, the Ramban and others point out, the two labial letters, pe and bet, are related to each other and often are swapped, akev and lakof, et cetera. And as a result of that, uh, we take a look at the word shevet, which we know is to mean tribe, also means a staff. Why is the same word for a staff the word for a tribe? Because the tribe is the group that moves, that circle, circles around uh, the person who holds the staff, who holds the shevet. So the shevet is the group around the shevet. By the way, we have another word in Hebrew, mate, which says the same thing. Uh, and so a shofet really means a leader. Now, typically, a shofet will be a leader in a court, and that's how it's used in Dvarim, for instance. But in the book of Shoftim, it's quite clear that a shofet is a military leader. And we see it here on, in this pane, in a, in a presentation in Sefer Shoftim at the beginning, when the entire history of the period is presented in a cyclical manner as saying, this is what would happen. The people would sin, and then they would be put under foreign oppression as a punishment from God. They would cry out after a number of years, and God would then send a shofet. Uh, Let's take a look at the key pasuk. God would then raise up Shoftim, who would save them from the ones who were pillaging them, and they people would then not follow them, but then they would follow them, a little confusing, and then the people would remain loyal to God until the Shofet died. Shofet here, in no sense of the word anywhere in Sefer Shoftim, is doing an act of judging. There are those who point to one line in the case Dafka of Dvorah, which says, people came up to her for mishpat, but the simple sense of the word there is they came to her for leadership, not for judging, not for a court case. And so that's what the shoftim is. Now, the Sefer Shoftim is broken up into three parts. The first part is something we're looking at here, which is the introduction, which presents the, an overview of the, of the, of the uh, era. Uh, and this is the era between Yehoshua and Shmuel, basically. And the last part, the last five chapters, is two horrific stories that take place much earlier in the Shoftim period, but are there to set the tone for the end of Shoftim uh, and for moving into, say, for Shmuel, something that we spoke about uh, last week in the context of Shmuel. And the middle, the bulk of the book, which is from the middle of chapter 3 through chapter 16, is what we call Alilot Shoftim, the stories of the Shoftim. And although there are approximately 12 Shoftim who are identified, or 13 by name, there are seven who are famous because they, uh, they have longer stories and they actually engage in wars. We hear about the wars, we know who the enemy is, and they are Otniel ben Knaz, who is Kalev's half-brother. They are Ehud ben Gerah from Shevet ben Yamin, uh, the famous lefty. Uh, they are 
Barak and Devorah, working together against Sisera. They are Gidon, who seems to be the most successful of the Shoftim. Uh, there is Yiftach, who is the focus of our Haftarah. And there is, of course, Shimshon, who we discussed a number of weeks back in the, in the Parsha of Naso, in Haftarah of Naso. Um, the, the stories of the Shoftim are interspersed in two places, uh, and that is uh, between the story of, Gid, of Gidon and Iftach, and then between the story of Iftach and Shimshon with minor Shoftim, who all we hear about is their name. They had a bunch of kids. They ruled for this long, and then they died. And we don't hear anything about their lives. And there are another six of those, one back in Perak Gimel, at the end of Perak Gimel, Shamgar ben Anat, and then another uh, five in the areas that I mentioned. Yiftach, who is our story, is a member of Shevet Menashe, who, um, who was the eldest son in his family, but his mother was a concubine. And later on, when the proper wife had children, those children sent him out and basically banished him because he was second rate, as it was. And he moved into an area called Eretz Tov, which is in the Gilad, which is in the uh, central, north central part of Jordan. And then when Ammon, Jordan, started threatening uh, Shev Menashe, they then came to Yiftach and said, please be our leader. And that was a testy negotiation. But the bulk of this uh, Haftarah and the bulk of this chapter, chapter 11 in Shoftim, is uh, Yiftach's interaction with the king, Nachash, the king of Ammon, and the uh, confrontational and very adversarial dialogue that takes place between through agents uh, between them about uh, Am Yisrael's rights to live there. Was it really ancestrally Ammon's land? Was it not Ammon's land? Or have you been for very for all this time? There's a little hint of the law of Cheskata Batim in this in this chapter. It's a fascinating story. What happens at the end of this story, which is not in this Haftarah, uh, is that um, is that uh, Yiftach made a vow to God, which is almost always a bad idea makes a vow to God that if he is successful in this war and God helps him in this war, the first thing that comes out of his house will be a korban. And tragically, he comes back successful from the war and his daughter comes out and he decides to make her a korban and he ends up killing her. And that's how the story of Yiftach ends, um, or at least that's how the chapter ends. Uh, but that part is, that is not part of our Haftarah. The bulk of our Haftarah, as you can see here, from Vayishlach Yiftach Malachim uh, in, in, until the almost the end, is um, is about his, the back and forth, which evokes the history in Parshat Chukat. The connection between this Haftarah and the Parsha could not be clearer, and it really is a uh, almost a uh, a uh, reflection and a retro uh, retrospective on the stories in Chukat through the eyes of the Nevi'im. Okay, everybody should have a wonderful Shabbat. Hopefully, this will help our understanding of the Haftarah of the Book of Shoftim and its relationship, and the relationship of this Haftarah to Parashat Chukat and the events that take place there. Shabbat Shalom to everyone.